It'd be a nice day and a nice evening and we'd decide that we'd have a dance. Right-o. We'd get some of the kids to get out with an old cow bell, square old metal thing they used to run up and down and sing out, dance tonight, dance tonight, Bill Crow's the MC, Tom Crow's playing the mouth organ, Mrs Jennings is on the piano, bring a plate, everybody. This is the way they were singing out up and down the street. And in half an hour, we'd have a dance in progress and we'd dance all night. A month or two, everyone, you know, knew one another, friendly and sit around a big sleeper fire of a night talking, having a yarn, boil the billy, a few biscuits. If you're lucky, you had a wireless. Uh, if you was unlucky, didn't have enough money, didn't have a wireless. Eh? Well, every Afghan had a different instrument. Some would play the old original Afghan songs. They'd always have a big tin dish. And, you know, and they played the tune to the song on that dish. The night prayers, the priest would call that, you know, you could hear it about a mile off. That was very, you know, good to listen to every night. I was born in Bulgaria, you know. I still like my country, you know, because I born there, I grow there, I have parents up there, and I still like my country, you know. I know for the mother's father is very hard. We can't see each other anymore, you know. When I ring up to the telephone, I can't talking with them. There's, when I grab the, the phone, and then straight away start to cry. See, I go in for heaven, I buy 50 doors for 25 minutes. And for 25 minutes, I can't say nothing. And I come back up here, I write one letter, I say, if next time I start to cry like first time, I never make telephone call again. Because I pay money for that, you know, to just to talking. I know because you seek for me, you know, I'm sick too. I think it's uh, so hard to live separate, you know. Edwin RL 43. RL 43, Edwin. Yeah, we would like to be on track at 202.7. Run, see it, please. Let me know when The 426 kilometres of rail between Mount Newman and Port Hedland is a continuous welded track. The constant pounding of the loaded ore cars creates brutal forces on the rail, and the extremes of heat and cold can cause the steel to snap. Each day, the Redmont gang has to check the line for 100 kilometres in each direction from the camp, for any cracks or damage to the track could cause a derailment. They used to have to run the length every morning on either side of their camp. They'd have 40 miles to contend with. 
due to the ex extensive heat in the daytime, the roads used to get hot. And the navvies used to say that the line spoke to them. It used to crack and move. It used to move as much as seven inches to the east or the west. Oh, well, if the settlers didn't do their job, the trains wouldn't be running because there's some was rails break, you know, the rails, they sell. Cold weather, they break a lot in the cold weather, real cold weather. The, the steel rails snap, snap like, just snap. <laughs> There she is, yes? I thought right. it must be a break because it was very cold during the night. Well, it's not a bad one. It's only be a 10 mil gap, straight break, get the gang down, we're just gonna drill and bolt it and lift the restriction back to normal. The camps uh, had a lot of people in them that were wanted by police, and they used to come out into these isolated areas uh, to get away. But uh, the policeman at uh, Tarkula told me one day that he knew every crim that was uh, out on the trans line. And I said, well, are they going to leave them there or what? He said, no, we'll just leave them there till we want them. Yeah, there was a few fights around, uh, only amongst the, uh, like, not amongst the uh, the Poms, Irishmen, or the Australians, that amongst the mainly amongst the Greeks, not Italians. They have a few scraps. But then there was a big bloke there by the name of Mick Blood, great big man. He was in charge of the quarry. He'd break that up. He'd go and get them and bash their heads together. <laughs> He'd stop the fights. Well, I can remember one night when Jack was sent up to Beresford with a police officer because of a disturbance up there, where the ganger had uh, already shot two of the fettlers and was on a real bad, went berserk and was really bad. This man was inside the cottages, but uh, they just walked straight in. And they, I suppose he expected them, and they took the rifle off him and expected the two bodies that he shot, and they had to convey those bodies back to Port Augusta. Well, you can understand a man living alone, cooking his own food and being isolated in a God-forgotten place where the crows fly backwards and all that sort of thing, you know. It's a terrible trying time. Their life wasn't happy. Redmond is such a different community and such a close-knit community that anybody who doesn't fit into Redmond very soon comes to people's attention. Very quickly, the person either recognises that he doesn't fit into the community or he's told that he doesn't fit in and uh, the, the person leaves. You get some people, you know, getting on booze and miss the other day of work, you know, stay in the cab, nothing to do, you know, get bored, start smashing the windows and all that. When the other uh, workmates get back to Redmond and uh, get argue with them and all that, and that's where it starts. Well, we told the guys if they want to fight, as long as they get out of the boundary list of the, of the company's sort of premises and they can go for their life. And um, then uh, the ones that wins, or the best one wins, they come back and tell us uh, where the body is and we can't pick them up. So uh, that seems to be work fairly well and uh, keep the guys under control. People tend to congregate, and the Yugoslavs in particular have got together in their own group and uh, they've been a very close-knit uh, little community within Redmond. They rather be together most of the times and talk their language and uh, they 
don't bother sort of to mix it with other people. I think that's sort of my interest, you know. If you're interested in to, le to learn something, you're going to mix it with other people, you know, to pick up a few words and all that, but they're not. For example, Yontin, Costa, uh, well, they've been much longer here in Australia than myself, and uh, I've been working with them quite a few years, and what I told of them, they not really interesting about the language at all, you know? They're interesting about the money. Redmond gang, before I come in, every single fellow there was the Yugoslav. We used to re-rail and do things with him, like together as two gangs. And they'd be all talking Yugoslav, and we'd be all talking English, and there was a big communication breakdown, like they'd be telling all the blacks, do this, do this, and they'd be saying in Yugoslav. And we'd be saying to blacks, do this and do this in English. Like you got that bald-headed Todorovsky on the job, telling him, do this and do that, and he looks around. He can't understand. But he's a top worker, he's the number one worker. But he looks at the other blokes and the other blokes that understand they've got to explain to him in Yugoslav. What do you want to do? Mainly most of the Yugos, they sort of keep to themselves this few that sort of mix with us. The other ones, they just want to sit and they just talk Yugoslav, nothing else. Costa and Yonche, they've been 17 or 18 years in this country. I don't think can learn this language forever. So I must talk to them Yugoslav. Some people get very upset, but it's not my fault. People can't understand the language, so you have to help him on the job. Generally, these people will sit back. They don't want to be seen to be making decisions because they've got some attitude about frightened of making a mistake. Just don't want to be involved or don't want to be held responsible rather than be involved. Just don't want to be responsible. There are great pressures on those who do take responsibility for work on the line. For when something does go wrong, the results can be disastrous. My first week, actually, I got woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning with a phone call from train control to say they want all your bulldozers, etc., down at the 30 kilometres that had a major derailment. When we got down there, it was one of the biggest messes I've seen for a number of years. Ivan Ruich was a foreman on the line at the time of a derailment back in 1975. A memorial was erected by friends in the grounds of Redmond Camp. What he did, uh, he left the responsibility to the ganga to finish off the job, and uh, apparently he didn't uh, do it properly, and, uh, which uh, caused the derailment. So, as he was good work and all that, and very honest, person, he couldn't stand, you know, to wait for the boss here and tell him, you know, what's happened. And uh, what happened in the morning, everybody heard, you know, a big explosion. Apparently what he did, uh, took a bit box, one box of explosive and all that, see that and blew himself up. And, uh, you know, we tried to find him, you know, it was very hard.
It's a frightening experience with 18,000 tons. If you do have a derailment, but uh, we don't like to think about derailments. In this job, if one person relies on another, from a ganger to a locomotive driver to a train controller, you have to lean on one another because without one another, you cannot have this safe operation. The gang work is vital to us. The drivers were all very, very considerate towards the navvies, and if they found a bump along the road, well, I did. If ever I found a bump along the road, I thought there was a cracked rail or something of that nature. I'd throw a little piece of coal and I'd wrap a, a train order around it and throw it off and say, there's a bump in the road at the 878 or wherever it happened to be, the mileage, uh, four telegraph poles away, east or west. And they used to go out and fix that, and they were very grateful for that too. They're the foundation of the railway, and they're the most neglected man in the universe for the nature of work that they do. It's a very, very hard job. Up until about five years ago, the process of maintenance here was continual. Every day, you'd be out doing basically the same task. In the last five years, there has been a move towards removing manual uh, methods off the line, and that has resulted in new technology being implemented on the railway. Well, Bill, what sort of uh, defects have uh, you recorded so far? Oh, well, we got... Uh severity uh, three on the surface right just back there I think the machine uh, will have an effect uh, with the gain uh, even now it, I can I can assure you that it has got some effect because with the machine that she can tune to very fine art and she can pick up a very minor severity rating there is no way in the eyes of any human being that we would be able to pick up a severity three rating I'm purely speaking about track fault but with the recorder yes the new technology that we're using have done away with a lot of the manual labouring work, but there will always be a need to have uh, you guys swinging your hammers because to bring a million dollar machine 200 kilometres to do a five minute job is not very economical. You've got to have somebody out there on that track. The type of work is changing and uh, so we're demanding that the people that are employed have some background in uh, mechanised skill. There are very few left on the railway now that uh, actually need brute strength to do work, but essentially we're looking for a more skilled kind of person. To be track foreman now, it's much, much different than what used to be four or five years ago. Today, most of my job is involved in the paperwork. In the past, we had four line camps, and very shortly we're going to end up with one, which is Redmond. And uh, I believe if the company is going to reduce the manning, I wouldn't be surprised if Redmond goes in the next few years. This is not total living, really, is it? You know, you just wake up and go to work and come back to your room. Uh, it's monotonous. Within a year, in a place like this, that's the maximum time you can sort of give of yourself. It's not really a, a life for a single break, really. 
Basically, all you're doing is you're just wasting time and wasting years. These days, I like to do a lot of things, but eventually, just as long as I've got a house, something super nice around Perth or Sydney, somewhere near a beach, a few kids running around, top missus. But on the other hand, I might turn around and go to the Philippines by myself for bar. See, I'm sort of up and down. I've still got a few years. I might as well try out. I'll go back to, I suppose. I stay for the money up here, you know? I'm not saved bloody for nothing. I want to pay my house off and save a little bit of money. I want to bring my father and my mother here, you know? I want, when they come, I want to show them what I'm doing for that time, you know? And when my father and my mother are here, to be happy. I have to stay up here because I have to make something for future, you know?